I'm Lenka, and I'll be presenting a paper on Telegram, which was a joint work with Martin Albrecht, Kenny Patterson, and Igor Stepanos. Telegram has grown in popularity in recent years, claiming to have reached 550 million users last year, but that's only a part of the picture. The thing that made it interesting is that it gained a reputation for being a protest app around the world. It was used for coordinating protests in Hong Kong and Belarus, just to give two examples. The cryptographic protocol securing Telegram is custom-made and does not follow standard practice. Yet, it has not received much detailed study. Three attacks were described in previous versions, and a recent paper proved Telegram to be secure in a symbolic setting. However, it abstracts most of the details of the building blocks of the protocol. Further, most of the focus on Telegram has been on so-called secret chats, which are supposed to provide end-to-end -end encryption. However, they have very limited functionality and seem to not be used much in practice. So most users, even the ones organizing protests, are actually using cloud chats, which only secure the client server links. And this is also the focus of our work. So the main thing to keep in mind is that um, we should be comparing this protocol to TLS rather than, um, for example, Signal. So MT Proto version 2.0, as it's called, runs directly over the transport, um, which is normally TCP or HTTP. And we looked at the official mobile clients uh, as well as the desktop client. At a very high level, um, the key exchange uses a variant of the DP Hellman key exchange, the output of which is a 2048-bit value, um, which is called the OUTH key. And then the symmetric channel um, could be described as a variant of a stateful encrypted MAC construction, which uses AES and IGE mode, which I will get to later, um, as well as um, a heavy use of SHA-256. The scheme has a few quirks. Um, the most important one being um, is that the client and server use different but related keys. So the direction matters for how a message is encrypted. And, and the symmetric channel is something we focused on in our work. I will now go through it um, in a bit more detail. So we start um, with the out key and um, a plain text payload. The entire out key is first run through SHA-1 and truncated to compute something called an out key ID, which just serves as an identifier for the connection. Next, a portion of the out key is run through SHA-256 together with the payload. And then the middle 128 bits um, of this output form a so-called message key, which will also serve as a MAC. Then a different portion of the out key is used with the message key in two more SHA-256 calls, which are then interleaved to produce a symmetric encryption key and IV. Finally, this key and IV are used to encrypt the payload using AES-256 in IGE mode. And so what is sent on the wire consists of the out key ID, message key, and the ciphertext. Um, there are two things you can notice at this point. First, um, that this is an encrypt and MAC scheme because the message key is sent along with the ciphertext and the receiver must decrypt first before checking the MAC. And the second thing is that the derived encryption key is message specific because um, it depends on the payload through the inclusion of the message key in the KDF. Now, one thing I didn't show in detail in the first diagram was how the various slices are actually taken from the out key and you can see it here. So when the client encrypts a message, it uses keys that are mostly overlapping with the keys that the server uses, but um, not fully. In terms of the plain text payload, um, this is what uh, the format of it actually looks like. So it has a header composed of 64-bit or 32-bit fields. And here, the first two fields are normally unchanged, unchanged for the duration of a single session where the server salt is generated by the server and the session ID is chosen by the client. And here the message data contains the actual request or response, which also has a specific format that we do not model. To say a bit more about the IGE node, so it stands for Infinite Garble Extension and it was first described by Campbell in 1978. And it has since reappeared under different names. As you can see from the diagram, it is basically like CBC mode with the addition of also changing the plain text box. It was supposed to have infinite error propagation and therefore provide integrity, but this claim is actually not true. 
However, MT Proto does not rely on this fact, and because of the message dependent keys, it is essentially only used as a one time cipher. I will now talk about some of the attacks that we found. So, first, the two protocol level attacks exploit the way the plain text payload format is validated. First attack is about message reordering in the client to server direction. And this is enabled simply because the server does not use the information in the plain text header to order incoming messages and instead only uses the order in which it actually receives the packets. And we confirm this in practice. The second attack is about what happens when messages are lost. So most messages in Telegram require a special acknowledgement message. However, if the client doesn't get this acknowledgement within a given time, it will re-encrypt the messages using the same header and hash padding, essentially making the stateful scheme not stateful anymore, which enables a theoretical NCPA attack. Further, the two implementation attacks use timing side channels. So first, we found an issue in the processing of a receipt ciphertext in various official clients, which enables partial plain text recovery. This was due to the message length field, which has certain constraints on it, and these were checked before the MAC in the message key was checked. In both cases, Telegram returned the same error, but there was a time difference because the message length check returned early on failure. This attack is similar to existing plain text recovery attacks on SSH, where the idea is to move a target ciphertext block to a position where the underlying plain text will be interpreted as a length field, and then use the resulting behavior to learn something about the target. Now, with IGE, this is uh, complicated slightly, but we can still recover between 8 to 32 bits of a 128 bit plain text block, assuming knowledge of two other plain text blocks. Now, since one of the known plain text blocks must be the first block, um, we focus on recovering this um, as part of the second attack. And this is actually an attack on the server during key exchange, because the initial server salt value comes from a secret nonce that the client sends to the server. And this nonce is encrypted using RSA and a custom padding format. So it turns out that this nonce can be recovered using Black and Becker style queries and lattice reduction. And as an added bonus, recovering this nonce also gives you a man in the middle on the key exchange, but it must be executed within a very short time interval. To speak about um, the responsible disclosure process, so we disclosed the results of our analysis to the Telegram developers in April of last year, which they acknowledged in June. And we agreed to a public disclosure date in July, which was 90 days after the initial disclosure. They also awarded a bug bounty for the timing side channel and for the overall analysis. During this process, we were informed that they do not do security or bug fix releases, except for immediate post-release crash fixes. So the vulnerabilities that we reported were addressed um, only as part of regular updates. And the versions that include these fixes are shown on the slide. So um, now I can talk about the formal modeling part of our work. Um, we use stateful bidirectional channels, um, which is an extension of the robust channel framework of Fischling, Günther, and Janssen. One of the reasons why we need a new model is the bidirectionality of the channel, because we wanted to capture exactly how the related keys are used. We also define a new notion of a support function, which we use in our definitions, extending the support predicate from previous work. And so this function determines not just whether a party should accept or reject an incoming ciphertext based on the current transcript of the conversation, but it also actually returns the corresponding plain text. And um, this formalization allows us to specify that the channel should prevent um, forgeries, replays, reordering, and omissions. We provide theme-based definitions for indistinguishability and integrity. And in our model, the adversary controls the randomness used for encryption. So using this um, framework, we provide a formal definition of the empty proto 2.0 channel. However, it should be noted that it is in general impossible to have a single specification 
that would capture the behavior of all official Telegram clients because they diverge, um, for example, in how they do message encoding. So our model in some sense represents the common core of the protocol. And for the proof, we require a number of assumptions. So first, some standard assumptions. And we require the collision resistance of Shadow 56 with truncated output. The one-time NCP security of CBC mode, because the security of IGE reduces to this. And one-time PRF security of Shaka 1, um, which is the block cipher underlying SHA-1. And finally, one-time PRF security of the compression function um, of SHA-256. However, we also require a number of non-standard assumptions. And these mainly refer to Shackle 2 behaving as a PRF in a variety of modes that include related keys and some key leakage to the adversary, as um, I will show in a bit more detail next. So we require that Shackle 2 is a leakage resilient PRF for fixed inputs under related keys. And to unpack this a bit more, this is actually two assumptions for different kinds of leakage, one of which is shown below. And some things to notice here are, um, firstly, the related keys. So this is quite different from the usual setting in the related key literature, where related keys tends to mean keys with a known difference between them. Um, however, here, the parts where the keys differ are actually random. The next thing is that um, half of the secret key is actually specified by the adversary. And these are the two parts that um, differ between the two assumptions in the details because they are parameterized by different functions that derive the actual related keys, both for the MAC and um, for the KDF. And this last part is common to the two assumptions. So for both of them, the input for the cipher is known and fixed. And this is just the initial state of SHA-256, here shown as um, IV-256. Now I can summarize um, the final results that we actually proved. Um, so first, the main thing, as you can see, is that aside from standard assumptions, indistinguishability depends on whether SHA-CAL1 and SHA-CAL2 can be considered as PRFs in various modes, some of which are highly non-standard. And in this result, the limiting term is this one. So we can only prove security up to Jupyter 64 queries. This is the result of the birthday bound on the Mac. It may not be tight, however, since we didn't manage to find the corresponding attack. The integrity result is a bit simpler, but follows a similar pattern. It depends on Shekel 1 and Shekel 2 behaving like PRFs and on collision resistance of SHA-256. And the same limiting term appears again. This time it's because of the plain text payload format, because the client and server consistently only check the 64-bit session ID. And this band would be easy to improve if Telegram made more changes to their protocol. The final thing to note is that this definition is with respect to a particular support function, which we defined to mandate in order delivery of messages. So to conclude, we gave the first comprehensive study of the symmetric channels underlying Telegram cloud jets. And if you would like to read more, you can check out the full paper um, at the link on the slide. Thank you for your attention. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the awesome uh, presentation. So Lenka, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome, thank you. So uh, let's see if we have any uh, questions from the audience, uh, whether you're online or virtual, or whether you're online or on site. Anyone? This is a great opportunity. No one wants to say the chance. Okay, so I'll, I'll, st I'll start with, uh, with my question. So uh, I think this is very impressive work. Uh, one question that I have. Hey, um, so for some reason the online the online access has been has been cut off, but I was told that we had five more minutes. Okay, it's back. So um, yeah, this is very impressive work. Uh, we all know that it, 
Telegram is extremely popular, right, and it's and is uh, you know increasingly used by those um, you know high risk uh, user base. So uh, I wonder why it took so long for research on uh, the security on the formal security of the Telegram protocol to appear. So let's say you know in the future if someone if some other uh, IM companies are going to develop another you know secure supposedly secure protocol, uh, what are the things that they could done right, they could do right to make it's easier for such formal analysis to appear? Yeah, so thank you. Um, that's a good question. There's uh, several things that um, can be done. Like one of the major obstacles in this analysis was um, the fact that um, the protocol is very complex in the sense that the crypto part of it um, is very interleaved with the application level. So that when we tried to extract some kind of specification from the uh, from the code, um, this was not an easy task to do. So, kind of a separation between um, the levels is uh, uh, one of the basic things. And um, yeah, I could also go on and on, but I'm aware that we have uh, very limited time. Awesome, thank you. Questions? Questions? If not, uh, I can ask. I can ask my next question. Um, so. I think your analysis is, pr is pretty impressive. Then, uh, you know, what's next? Do you have any future plans for, uh, you know, research either on the security of the Telegram protocol or on the protocols for other things? So I think on the Telegram side, there's still a potential for future work because we focused mainly on the symmetric um, side of things. So um, a formal model of the key exchange would be an obvious next step. And um, in that direction also, because our work concludes with um, the fact that we depend upon some unsteady assumptions on Shadow 56, that's also an opportunity for um, study more on the symmetric cryptanalysis side on whether these assumptions actually hold up to scrutiny. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Lenka. So I do not see any more questions, uh, whether that's on site or virtual. So I would, uh, you know, again, congratulate you for uh, getting one of the best paper awards uh, at Oakland uh, 2022. So